Now is the moment to learn hope. Now is the moment to learn hope. Now, when there seems so little ground for hope. Now, when refugees and migrants are drowning in the sea. Now, when racism and fascism are surging in Europe, in North America and elsewhere. Now, when even to mention hope seems like a sick joke or even an insult to the millions and millions of young people who face a life of unemployment or sometimes worse, employment. Now is the time to learn hope, time to repeat the words with which Ernst Bloch opened his great book, The Principle of Hope, written largely when he was in exile from the Nazis, written in a world dominated by fear. Now, more than 70 years later, fear is on the rise again, and hope the hope of a radically different world is in danger of becoming extinct. To learn hope, not just to hope, not just to hope oh, and think, oh, everything will be fine. No. Bloch spoke of a doctor space, a reasoned hope, a learned hope, a hope with substance, a way of thinking that opens paths to a different world. That, it seems to me, is what can become weak or even be extinguished. And I think we're in danger of that. I suspect that our grandparents, in the same way as they knew much more about trees and birds than we do, probably knew more about hope too. The world is closing. I think that's, that's really what worries me. There is a closure taking place, a very material closure that is supported by a closure of the mind. Walls are going up, borders are becoming stricter and more violent. The deeper and deeper penetration of money into education, healthcare, and all areas of life erects barriers to keep out those without money and barriers to keep out any form of thought that does not contribute to the expansion of money. There is a closing of real possibilities of what we can do with our lives, but there is also a closing of our senses, a closing of what we are able to imagine, and I think a closing of education, a closing of what children learn in school, a closure, a closing of our capacity to think and feel certain things. And this closure of the mind reinforces the walls that are going up. Writing in 1795, just after the French Revolution or during the French Revolution, William Blake imagined the reactions of the kings of Asia to the revolutionary upsurge in Europe. He imagined the kings calling on their counselors to cut off the bread from the city that the remnant may learn to obey, that the pride of the heart may fall, that the lust of the eyes may be quenched, that the delicate ear in its infancy may be dulled and the nostrils closed up to teach mortal worms the path that leads from the gates of the grave. And Blake was writing in 1795, but he could easily have been writing this year or last year. He could easily have been thinking of Greece, for example, in the last few years, where the rule of money articulated through the governments of the Eurozone 
is literally cutting off the bread from the city that the remnant may learn to obey that the pride of the heart may fail that the lust of the eyes may be quenched and from what i hear of from friends in greece that is exactly what is happening not just that they are poorer much poorer than a few years ago but that there also there is also a deep depression and to learn to hope is to say no to closure to open our nostrils sharp and our ears emancipate the lust of our eyes and the pride of our heart above all it is to open our minds and our senses to the possibility of a radically different world a world that is not based on money and profit that is what is closing perhaps the confidence or even the dream that there can be a world beyond capitalism and yet we know that capitalism is a catastrophe we all know that that is not really a issue and it is not really controversial or even radical to say that capitalism is a catastrophe this form of social organization is destroying our lives causing destruction and misery throughout the world destroying other non-human forms of life destroying the necessary preconditions of human existence and if we do not change radically the form of organization radically and soon then it is very possible or indeed probable that it will lead us to extinction organizing our relations with other people through money is not just absurd humiliating dehumanizing it also creates a dynamic that nobody controls not even the richest of capitalists not even the most powerful of politicians a dynamic of aggression that is usually called progress a dynamic of aggression that in the song of banner last night was called war or more traditionally a dynamic of aggression that we can call class struggle a destruction of our lives our communities our dreams our imagination radical for me here we are trying to rediscover the radical this weekend radical is not saying how terrible the world is it's not saying what a catastrophe capitalism is because if you actually probe anybody it seems to me are not anybody but really part of the population and that people will say yes capitalism is a catastrophe it's a disaster but we don't have anything else so radical for me is not saying that capitalism is a disaster but rather opening our minds to the possibility of creating something else so that the challenge is not to say that capitalism is a disaster the challenge is we need to think beyond it to go opening our minds and our senses to not just the necessity but the possibility of breaking capitalism of breaking and creating something else and by that by hope i do not mean the hope that we might be able to create a fairer capitalism an anti neoliberal capitalism that sort of hope really seems to me to be resignation it says in effect we have to give up on our stupid revolutionary dreams we know perfectly well what happened in russia and china 
We know that revolution was a failure in the 20th century. Therefore, we have to accept this sick society based on the expansion of profit. But perhaps we can make it a bit better by voting in a government that may not be anti-capitalist, but is at least anti-neoliberal. And so realism comes to replace radical hope. The critique of neoliberalism takes the place of the critique of capitalism. And the problem, the problem with this realism is that it is totally unrealistic. This sort of radical parliamentary, new left, anti-neoliberal, halfway hope simply will not work. As is so clearly illustrated by the spectacular turnaround of the great government of hope, the series of government in Greece last year, or indeed by Bolivia or Venezuela today. The danger of this unrealistic realism is that it ends up being totally realistic. No more hope, just repression, as in Greece today. At the end of the day, this realism means accepting the rule of money, the rule of profit, with all the violence and all the suffering that that inevitably involves. The government of hope turned out, in the Greek case, to be a grotesque betrayal of people's hopes. And yet, and yet, I wonder, Corbyn and Sanders and Podemos carry on as though nothing had happened, as though they never read about what happened in Greece. So neoliberalism sounds like a good critical category, but more and more I'm convinced that its effect is just the opposite. In a way, it is the product of the closing of our minds, the narrowing of our imaginations. We know that capitalism is a catastrophe, but we are no longer able to think beyond it, so we just think of improving it, of trying to go back to a long-dead welfare state which will not return, and not because the politicians do not want it, but because the intensity of capital's crisis is such that there is no room for it. The problem is not neoliberalism, the problem is capitalism. A society organized around money and its expansion. Kill it, create something else. And I say that, I mean, there's a possible, I'm not, I don't want to say it in a sectarian way. I don't want to say, oh, if you talk about neoliberalism, you're just a reformist. That's not the point. It just seems to me that, yes, we all talk about neoliberalism. We're all horrified by the neoliberal, the effect of neoliberal policies over the last 20 years. But if we don't think beyond neoliberalism, if we don't say, well, the problem is not just neoliberalism, and it's not a question of politicians, of political options. The problem is capitalism. The problem is this grotesque, absurd, vomit-making form of social organization. Why on earth do we accept to have money as the central axis of social organization when we know what that means, when we know what that means in terms of 
dehumanization, degradation, massive inequality, war, violence, and the dynamic that is leading us towards our own destruction. Why on earth do we accept to have money as the axis of our social relations, as the form through which we relate to other people and their activities? That is the problem. Hope, as I understand it, is hope against, or better, hope against and beyond. It is not just, oh, I hope tomorrow will be just like today. Rather, it is, I hope tomorrow will be different from today. And to learn hope means, I think, to have some concept of what we are hoping against. And for me, and even though I sometimes feel that perhaps this sounds very old-fashioned, for me, this means having a concept of capital. A ca concept of capital as a historically specific and therefore potentially transitory form of social relations. A specific way of doing things that is characterized by the rule of money by exploitation, by the commodification of everything that be, can be, be, be commodified. But capital as a way of doing things, if we think that the enemy is capital as a way of doing things, as a way of organizing ourselves, then this puts, puts on the agenda immediately the question of, well, why don't we do things in a different way? Why don't we organize ourselves in a different way? Whereas neoliberalism, it seems to me, puts on the agenda, well, why don't we vote for a different government next time round? So, hope against capital. And then the question arises, Fine, we can say that here. I can say that I know we're in a conference, a radical rediscovering the radical conference. I know that if you're here, then in some sense you must be radical. It's so easy to make this argument. But if we make it outside, then who will listen? Who will listen if we talk about capital and revolution? Because when we act, or when we write plays, or when we teach, because it seems to me more or less the same thing, we're not just laying down the correct line. We are actually talking to people. And perhaps if we just criticize neoliberalism, then people will listen. If we go against capitalism and talk about revolution, then perhaps people will say, oh no, that's old dogma. We won't listen to that. That's not interesting. And that's too extreme. In the real world, we have to deal with ordinary people. So the question is, in a way, do we not need to tone down our language for them, for the ordinary people of the real world? And I think the answer is no. That we in this room are really not so special. We are, of course, very special, but not all that special. We, we are actually ordinary people. And the most profound and the most challenging thing, I think, that the Zapatistas say is we are ordinary people. We are ordinary women and men, children and old people. That is to say, we are rebels. But to say that, to take that seriously, we have to be able to recognize and touch the rebelliousness in everyday life. We have to be able to go to the supermarket and see that old couple over there choosing their, their food 
important we have to be able to say they are rebels. Or we have to be able to go home, to go out in the streets perhaps after today's conference and see the young people hurrying home from work or getting ready to go out clubbing. And we have to be able to say they are rebels. And in order to do that, we have to break appearances. We have to understand people as being self-divided, as being self antagonistic, as being schizophrenic in the popular sense of the word. We have to understand that the grey conformism of the people around us, the grey conformism of ourselves, is in fact composed of contrasting, clashing, black and white, and that this internal clash of contrast, this internal clash of black and white, yes, is partly absorbed or partly blended into a grain, a conformist grain, but not entirely. Ordinary people are composed of extraordinary parts, parts that aren't entirely absorbed into the grey beige blend that we normally present to the world. No. That it seems to me that when we teach or when we do theatre, it is not that we are laying down the correct line, that doesn't make sense. We are of course talking to people, but perhaps that's not quite nice either. We are actually addressing something inside people. We are trying to touch something inside them that does not necessarily fit together neatly with the rest of them. Something loose nerve ends that hang out. We're trying to touch something that doesn't fit, that pushes against and beyond the rest of them. And I think that, that that seems to me that to think of what we are doing, that's the question, what are we doing? To think of what we are doing in that way is perhaps the key to thinking beyond the classic problem of always preaching to the converted, preaching to lefties through theatre or through teaching is too easy. The problem is how do we reach these contradictions that exist within everybody. So we, when we talk to people, we are reaching for a hidden world. And there is a beautiful, I'm sure you probably all know it, you ought to all know it, but if you don't anyway, here it is. There's a beautiful <coughs> sentence written by Arundhati Roy that says, Another world is not only possible, she's on the way. And on a quiet day, if you listen very carefully, you can hear her breathe. A hidden world, a world that does not yet exist but is on the way. A world that moves against and beyond the existing world. An anti-identitarian world that does not yet exist and therefore exists not yet as anticipation, as struggle, as dream, as rebelliousness, as loose nerve ends, as refusal to accept, as scream against the existing society. It is this world, this world that does not exist that is the axis of hope. And to learn to hope, I think, is to learn to think from a world that does not yet exist, but could potentially exist. A world that does not yet exist and therefore exists not yet as negation, as refusal, as dream. And we who refuse to accept, we who refuse to abandon hope. 
what are we doing? As teachers, as theatre people, I think we are trying to listen to this world that does not yet exist but is on her way, to hear her breathe and magnify the sound, to hear her breathe by taking as her starting point the millions and millions of refusals, of struggles, of waves of living that push against and beyond creating or affirming other forms of social relations, creating or affirming other ways of doing things, other ways of doing things that take as their central principle, not money, but the creation of the common or the communizing. And perhaps it's not just a question of listening, to this other world that's on its way, on her way, but of resonating, of understanding her own activity as resonating with this world of the not yet, as trying to stir vibrations of harmony and discord, trying to recognize, create an old and new music to move in the old and new grammar of resistance and rebellion, an old and new grammar of rage and hope, of schizophrenia and bright colours, of asking we walk, of creativity. The old idea of revolutionary communication was centred around the idea class consciousness and bringing consciousness to the masses. And I think that that didn't work very well. It didn't work very well because the hierarchical notion that it was based on actually led, I suspect, to a passivity far removed from revolution. And in any case, the institutional structure which was based party, the revolutionary party, no longer exists in real terms. Now I think it is better to think of resonances. We are surrounded by often half-conscious, rebellious angers or experiments that often find difficulty in articulating themselves and in communicating with other rebellious angers. I see theatre, music, teaching, writing, dancing as attempts to resonate with those angers and communicate and with those angers and to promote their confluence. I mean, obviously, there are also very conscious angers, very conscious anti-capitalist organisations, and it seems to be very important well to think of radical theatre, the theatre is strengthening those. I mean, I think that's a bit what we saw last night with the wonderful performance of, of Banner. But I think we have to go beyond that. I think we have to try and touch these unorganised, inarticulate, half-conscious rebelliousnesses, angers, experiments of doing things in a different way that exist all over the place, literally all over the place, and that that is the real challenge for us, whether we are teachers or, or theatre people. And in this world, in this hidden world that we are trying to reach, I think we have to accept that rage is fundamental. That the world that Arundhati Roy can hear in her gentle words is actually a world of anger, a world of rage. And the last few years have made it very clear what a powerful substratum of rage is present even in the apparently most tranquil societies and what nasty forms it can take. 
Rage is a fundamental part of a society based on exploitation and destruction. Rage is fundamental to a society built on the frustration of our creative capacities. A society that forces us to mold those creative capacities and sell them in the service of the expansion of profit. There is a structural anger built into the society even when we are not conscious of it. And it is now clear that that anger is erupting in ways that are very destructive. Hope is unthinkable with ang without anger. I think hope grows from anger. Hope grows from saying no. We cannot accept society as it is. We must go somewhere else. So hope is unthinkable without anger. Hope is directed against an aggressive, disgusting, foul, pestilent society. But that certainly does not mean that anger necessarily leads us forward in the pursuit of what we hope for. There is an anger then that opens and an anger that closes, that builds wall. There is a dignified rage, a rage with dignity, a digna labia, as the Zapatistas called it. They dedicated a festival to the theme of La Digna Labia about five years ago. A rage of resistance and rebellion. And there is also a rage that perpetuates the oppression of capital. A rage that does not seem capable of going beyond the established categories of money and state. There is the rage of a world waiting to be born and the rage that is trapped inside the world, the walls of a dying world. A rage without hope. The world that is on her way is a world of anger, an anger that breaks barriers, a world where anger and hope are inseparable. Somehow then we have to touch that rage that is so deeply woven in society today and make that rage ours, to help it to break barriers, to infuse it with a hope that takes us beyond capital. That seems to me just so urgent at the moment. In this hidden world, okay, there's a rage that we must touch. There is also a creativity and a need for creation. This actually doesn't help us very much if we go out on Saturday and break the windows of the banks. And then on Monday, we have to go back to work and start rebuilding capitalism again. That doesn't get us very far. And if we say, we want more jobs, we want more employment, this is really the current situation, the situation in Greece, I suppose, last year, this year too. If we say, well, we want more jobs, we want more employment, then the logical answer, the answer to the government always gives is that if you want employment, then you, we must create conditions that are favorable to capitalist investment. And creating cap conditions capable, favorable to capital in, capitalist investment means that, yes, we can create more jobs, but you'll have to accept lower pay, you'll have to accept that you won't have any rights, you'll have to accept dreadful conditions. And so we're trapped. So that the only thing we can do is to realize that to be against capital is to be against labor. No? To be against capital is to be against that monstrous transformation 
of our daily activity into a labor dedicated to the expansion of profit. And there must, even if you work in the state or even if you, whatever you do, I mean, we all know finally that people won't employ you unless you are contributing in some way to the reproduction of the system. Okay, they can make mistakes and we can make, take advantage of, of um, contradictions in the system. Yes, that we can do. But at the same time, we have to understand that really rejection of capital is rejection of employment. And how can we do that? Well, we can only do that if we have alternative ways of living. We can only do that if we actually create different ways of surviving, and not just surviving, but living. No, we can only do that if we are able to say to the government, you know, we're not interested in more employment, go and stuff your, your jobs. We actually are creating a different kind of living. I think that is absolutely necessary. I think it's being realized more and more. There are more and more people in the world who by necessity or by choice are doing everything they can to realize that those other forms of living. But I think we also have to recognize that that is our weakness. No? That in our moments of rebellion, we do actually need employment in order to survive and to, if we want employment, then we have to accept that that means creating conditions favorable to the accumulation of capital. That, that, that is our great, our great problem. Okay, so that, that's a problem in the hidden world. The other thing, the, which really, um, takes us to the, the, the third problem, the third, third issue in this hidden world that we're trying to, 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 to touch, I think, is the understanding that um, this, this world waiting to be born is a world that walks asking. Hope, as Bloch put it, is a utopian star, not a blueprint for the future. We have a general idea of where we want to go, distilled from the dreams of hundreds of years of struggle, but we have no definite plan. We no longer have a defined, a clearly defined highway to revolution, thank goodness. The only paths forward are the ones we make by walking them, and the world that we want to create world of many worlds, so that hope is necessarily a creative experimental movement, the creation of spaces and moments of resistance and rebellion, the creation of cracks in the texture of capitalist domination, of spaces and moments in which we refuse to follow the rule of money, the rule of capital, and create other ways of doing things against and beyond the existing world. And all of these cracks are contradictory. All of these cracks are crazy. But there are millions and millions and millions of them. And probably all of us here are involved in creating them in some way. And that the only way I can conceive of revolution today is as the recognition, creation, expansion, multiplication, and confluence of such cracks. Listen carefully, and we can hear the old world cracking. Look carefully, and we see that that is precisely what we are doing here this weekend. In the program, it says something about my optimistic vision. So is this the optimistic vision that you promised? I'm not sure that it is. 
what I feel, I suppose, is that we are probably now in a race where there are just two competitors. On the one hand, the drive towards the self-annihilation of humanity, driven by money quite uncontrolled by any conscious will. And on the other, the abolition of capitalism and the creation of a self-determining, communizing society. And in this race, who will win? We do not know. But it is clear that we are not neutral observers, that we do actually have our preference, that we support the second competitor, the communizing one, that we bet on her, because in a way that's, that's exactly what we do with our lives and that with our teaching or our theatre. We bet on a possible outcome and we will do all we can to make sure she wins. Our hope is that she should win, even if often we feel that she has no chance. And in order to support her, we need to learn hope. I, I am a fairy. Whenever I give an opening talk, it's not quite an opening talk, but it's almost an opening talk at a conference. I think that this turns me into a fairy who's been invited to express, express my wishes for the event that is just beginning its life. And my wishes for the discussions of these days, of today and tomorrow, are that they should go beyond moaning about how awful existing society is to thinking about how to change it that they should perhaps push beyond the critique of neoliberalism to the critique of capitalism. That they should focus on how we can touch that hidden world of the not yet that is on her way. How we can touch and express and strengthen that angry, creative, hopeful push towards a different society. Thank you.